Well, hello, everybody. We're glad you're here. And I need to find some information. Hang on one moment. And something happened to my screen here. So it'll just take me a second. This is Tech for Senior, October 7th, 2024, episode 235. I'm Huey Poplock, and I'll be your host today. Ron is here, but he's my co-host. We do this the first show of every month to give Ron a little time for himself. This is a one-hour show about technology with a question and answer period at the end. Tech Talk with Bob, fun with photos, live motion photos with Chris. October is Cybersecurity Awareness Month. Our security expert uh, presented will be presented by Bob. A website of the week from me, how products are made. And of course, our music session with Ray and then the Q&A. Again, I'm Huey and I'm in the middle of a storm area. And uh, there's a good possibility that I may have to be without power for a week or more. So we'll see what happens. Anyway, uh, Ron, you're here, but you're not the uh, the host, you're a co-host. How are you doing today? Relaxing. That's good. You deserve it. <laughs> you, wor you work hard the other weeks. And I know because I do it on the first Monday of the month. We did we did run into a little snag this morning, uh, but we'll we'll figure that out. So if Ron shouldn't be here, we we might not have been on the air, but uh, we'll we'll correct that. Bob, you're the voice of Tech for Seniors. How are you doing? Gee, you I probably said all those things and it nobody nobody heard it. No. I said we're just fine here. Another nice day. We're not expecting anything. And for those of you who are, stay safe. Thank you. Uh, Ray, our music director, what's going on in Arizona? Well, as I typically am, the first Saturday of each month, I'm down for a music group I belong to. And uh, surprise, surprise, here we are into October, and it was uh, still 112 degrees. So uh, hopefully, I think after this week, the forecast is finally going to get back to normal, whatever that is. And, and Bill, our, our, Bill James, our generalist, he knows a little bit about everything, and now actually he knows a lot about everything. So uh, he's a PC, a Mac person. He's a, He likes gadgets. And by the way, Bill, I've got a couple of videos I'm going to send you that have a couple of hundred gadgets that you can have fun looking at and maybe pick some out for us. Oh, I appreciate that. Thank you. Well, I think I'm a jack of all tr trades and a master of none. But I enjoy uh, learning. So as long as that, that's kind of my gold. Yeah, I, I, I find that you know, I decided to go ahead and do an article about something, and I realized how little I actually know about it. So I have to learn a whole bunch in order to put one of the videos together. And we all go through that. Yeah. It's just there's so much with everything that we do that uh, to be able to explain it and demonstrate, a lot of times we've got to do a lot of learning ourselves. And speaking yeah. of that, hi, Chris. Geeks on Tour, <laughs> our photo expert. Hi. Always enjoy coming to this and learning some new things myself yeah. and the fun with photos is one of my well they're all my favorite topics but motion photos is a special one now we did a yeah. show last week about traveling without signal being offline yeah and being offline so that might come in handy for a few of you <laughs> over there yeah. on the a hurricane yeah check it yeah, out i watched your i watched your show yesterday and of course i learned some new things i always do <laughs> okay, this is Tech for Senior. We're in our fifth year. Make sure you take a look at our website, wow. www.techforsenior.com. Coming up is the Tech for Senior Live on Thursday. Hopefully, I'll be there. Uh, Sunday is the Windows Special Interest Group, if I have power. The STUG meeting was this past Wednesday, October 2nd. The presentation was Ray Baxter, and he talked about technology always seems to be changing the way we listen to music at home and in the car. It's on the Stug YouTube channel. And once we get started, I will post the link to it if you want to watch it. Uh, and my Let's Talk AI is on the fourth Friday of October, uh, will be October 25th. And it is open to all of you. 
Uh, be sure to subscribe to our newsletters, the Tech for Senior newsletter, my Windows Special Interest Group newsletter, and if you're interested, the Let's Talk uh, AI uh, and the AI premiere, to, or I'm sorry, the premiere video today on the next half hour is replacing uh, the operating system uh, live with Ray Baxter. Uh, the second one will be organization, uh, organize uh, and share your travel photos with Chris Gould and setting up a new iPad from me. And that's when I got my new iPad. So let's get started with another great show. So, uh, Bob, why don't you take it away? Here's my Tech Talk and Beyond for the week ending October 4th, 2024. This week's topic, Is Your Smartphone Spying on You? How to Take Back Control Ever had that creepy feeling when your phone shows you an ad for something you just thought about buying? You didn't search it, didn't say it out loud, yet there it is, staring back at you from your screen. What if I told you your smartphone might be tracking more about you than you ever imagined? Stick around because in the next few minutes, we're going to uncover the truth about how much your phone actually knows about you, how it's collecting your data, and more importantly, how you can stop it in its tracks. We carry our smartphones everywhere. They're practically glued to us. But while they keep us connected to the world, they're also constantly collecting information in the background. From location data to browsing habits, apps and services are quietly siphoning off your personal data and sending it to, well, who knows where. And what does that mean for your privacy? Well, the short answer is it's disappearing. You might think, I have nothing to hide. But do you really want companies, or worse, hackers, knowing where you are, what you like, and who you talk to? Let's dig into what's happening under the hood and what you can do to fight back. Here's the kicker. Your smartphone is always listening, watching, and tracking. Let's break down some of the ways it's gathering information. Location tracking. Your phone constantly knows where you are, even when you're not using GPS. Apps collect this data to provide location-based services, but they also sell it to advertisers. Suddenly, your trip to the coffee shop isn't just your business. It's theirs, too. Microphone access. Ever get the feeling your phone is eavesdropping on your conversations? Well, apps with microphone access can listen in on what you say, even if you're not actively using the app. Yes, they claim it's to improve your experience, but you have to wonder, improve whose experience? App permissions. Most apps request a laundry list of permissions when you install them. Do they really need access to your contacts, camera, and messages? Nope, but they want it, and once you grant that access, they have free reign to gather all sorts of personal data. Background data. Even when you're not using an app, it can still be active in the background, collecting data. It's like a spy in your pocket, silently taking notes on your activity. Wi-Fi tracking. Ever notice how your phone automatically connects to public Wi-Fi networks you've used before? This convenience comes at a price. Your phone is constantly scanning for Wi-Fi networks, which can be used to track your location and even your movements from store to store in a shopping mall. Bluetooth beacons. You might not even know they exist, but Bluetooth beacons are all around us. These small devices can communicate with your smartphone when Bluetooth is enabled, tracking your location and interactions. 
Retailers use them to know which aisle you're in and even push specific ads based on where you are in the store. Gyroscope and accelerometer. Bet you didn't know your phone's gyroscope and accelerometer. The sensors that track motion can be used to spy on you. Some apps can collect this data to infer your movements, like how often you pick up your phone, where you're walking, or even how fast you're driving. Third-party data sharing. When you install an app, you're not just sharing your data with that app developer. Many apps sell your data to third parties, advertisers, data brokers, and who knows who else. So when you're using that free app, it's likely profiting off your personal information. Keyboard tracking. Some apps have been known to log what you type, including sensitive information like passwords and credit card numbers. Even if this data is anonymized, it's still unsettling to think about the level of access some apps have. Ad trackers. Even if you've turned off personalized ads, there's no guarantee that ad trackers aren't still following you around the web. These trackers log your browsing habits, app usage, and even how long you stay on a particular page, all to build a profile about you. Taking back control, steps to protect your privacy. Now that you know how your smartphone might be spying on you, it's time to fight back. Limit app permissions. Don't let apps have more access than they need. Go into your phone settings and review what each app is allowed to do. Don't be afraid to deny access to your microphone, camera, or location if it's not absolutely necessary. Turn off location services. Sure, it's convenient to let your phone know where you are, but do you really need every app knowing your exact location 24-7? Turn off location services for apps that don't need it. You can always toggle it on when you actually need it. Use a VPN. A virtual private network can help protect your browsing data by masking your IP address and encrypting your internet traffic. It's an easy way to add a layer of security to your online activity and keep prying eyes out. Disable background app refresh. If an app doesn't need to be active when you're not using it, turn off background refresh. This limits the app's ability to collect data while it's in the background, and it'll also save your battery life. Win-win! Turn off always-on listening features. Voice assistants like Siri, Mr. G, and Miss A are convenient, but they're also always listening. If you don't want your phone listening to your every word, disable the Hey S and OK G features. Update your software regularly. Hackers love exploiting outdated software. Keeping your phone's operating system and apps up to date ensures you have the latest security patches and bug fixes, which makes it harder for anyone to exploit your phone. Use end-to-end -end encryption for messaging. Apps like Signal and WhatsApp offer end-to-end -end encryption, which means only you and the person you're communicating with can see the messages. Not even the app developers can access them, keeping your conversations private. Turn off ad tracking. Many smartphones have an option to limit ad tracking or reset your advertising ID. This won't stop all data collection, but it'll help reduce the amount of data advertisers can use to target you. Use strong passwords and biometrics. Protect your phone itself with a strong password or biometric security, like fingerprint or facial recognition. If your phone is ever lost or stolen, this can prevent someone from accessing your personal data. What about those ads that feel like they're reading your mind? Yes, the ads that pop up right after you think about buying something. This isn't magic. It's called predictive analytics. 
apps send services collect so much data about you, your browsing habits, your location, your past purchases, that they can often predict what you might want next. It's not that your phone is literally reading your mind. It's just gathering so much data that it feels like it. But still, it's unsettling, right? To combat this, disable personalized ads in your phone's settings. It won't completely eliminate the tracking, but it'll cut down on the creepy factor. Conclusion Your phone, your rules. At the end of the day, your smartphone should work for you, not spy on you. Taking a few simple steps can drastically improve your privacy and give you back control over your digital life. Don't wait until it's too late. Make these changes now and stop your phone from being your personal spy. You'll find the video used in today's Tech Talk at the link listed. Did you know? When glass cracks, it seems almost instantaneous thanks to the speed at which glass shatters. Cracks form in glass at a staggering 3200 meters or 10,498.69 feet per second. Thomas Edison invented an electric pen in 1876 that was later adapted to become the first tattoo machine in 1891. Cherry trees grown from cherry tree seeds kept aboard the International Space Station for eight months have started blooming years ahead of schedule, and researchers aren't sure why. Just thought you might want to know. Just because they say it's impossible doesn't mean you can't do it, thanks to Roger Bannister. In my humble opinion, to not try at all is even worse. And that's a wrap for this week's Tech Talk and Beyond. Stay safe, stay secure, and I'll see you again next week. Bye-bye, and thanks for reading, watching, and listening. Yeah, Bob, uh, some of the things that uh, phones do about collecting data, I like. I just got my notice uh, from last month of all of the places I traveled to with a map and so on, and I can go back a couple of years, several years, and see where I went, and it actually will list the different stops that I made. So, and that's fun to look at, and I don't have a problem with it doing that. So sometimes uh, turning off some things can be fun. And one last thing, you were talking about glass shattering. I saw recently a, a pile of glass, and they called it a do-it-yourself kit for making windows. And with that, we'll turn it over to Chris. And uh, she's going to talk about live motion photos. Chris, go ahead. Okay, yeah, this is a feature on most phones, not all. So iPhone, definitely Samsung, higher models. But it, if you have it, use it. It's so yeah. cool. Have you ever noticed when you're swiping through your photos on your phone, that there's some movement in there. On your iPhone, that's called Live Photo. I want to show you where it comes from and what you can do with it. Then Samsung and Pixel have similar features. On Samsung, it's called a motion photo, and on the Pixel, it's top shot. iPhone is by far the most feature rich so that's where I'm going to spend most of the time today. And then I will show you just a little bit of Samsung and tell you about the Pixel. First, how to take a live photo with an iPhone. It's, in, it's just in your camera. You tap on the little bullseye in the upper right hand corner. You make sure that you're set to photo and then you just snap a picture with the shutter button like normal and I want to I want to show you that and one of the really interesting things is it captures motion before you snap the shutter button so I'm going to ask Jim to use his hands and count one two three four five I'm going to snap the shutter on three and then show you the results so here is the Apple camera and it's this button right up at the top. 
Notice I'm in, I'm in standard photo mode and that little bullseye, I tapped it once and it says live off. I tap it again and it says live. So the live feature is now on. And Jim's gonna go one, two, three, three. four, five. So I tap the shutter button on the count of three and let's see what I got. So I see a photo that looks like just a still shot of when he's holding up three fingers. But if I touch and hold on it, You see all, you see the whole count of five. So then what can you do with it? You can, you can pick a frame. So this is all on the iPhone and how you pick a frame is you go into edit mode. So on this photo, I tap the edit button. It's this little sliders button. And then you tap the live button and then you can pick another frame so I can go to where he just had up one. If I wanted to have an I'm number one and you tap make key photo. But let's look at some better examples. So here is a motion photo that I think is a little bit more interesting. It was somebody jumping into the water scuba diving and she's halfway into the water, but touch on it. You see, I get her actually jumping. I would like to have her mid air edit live and find the one where she's midair and make key photo. Now that is the photo that will show. When I tap done, that's the photo that shows, but there's lots, lots more. Right up here where it says live, I can make this picture loop, meaning she will just continuously be jumping into the water. That is a loop. I could also bounce, meaning she goes into the water and back out, <laughs> <laughs> into the water and back out. Or I could long exposure. Now this is not an appropriate picture for long exposure. I'm just going to go back to live. Now here's one where I told Jim, my, my guinea pig for all things photo, <laughs> I told him to blink a lot. So the, the photo that got captured has his eyes closed. If I edit and go into the live mode, I can find one where his eyes are open. There, his eyes are open there. Make key photo and done. And this one, he, she was serving us champagne and I wanted her to be looking at us and smiling. And I know there. That's what I want. Edit, live, and find, find that frame. There, much better. Make key photo and done. Now here is one that is appropriate for the long exposure. This is a waterfall. If I tap and hold, you see there is motion and there's sound, but sound isn't important for this purpose. Live, and long exposure and you'll see the water become a soft waterfall i call it and it's do it's working some other magic too it's making sure that there isn't any motion in the background it's stabilizing the background as it does a long exposure for the water way cool and the last thing you can do is you can, if I, you just tap on the three dots, if I'm back to just a normal live photo, one of the things you can do is save as video. So instead of the photo and the video, it just becomes a video, it makes it easier to share that way if you want the motion. To review, with an Apple Photos, you can pick a different frame, for the still shot. That's called the key photo. You can save the video separately. You can make it loop or bounce. That's fun. And you can make it in a long exposure. What if you have a Samsung phone? It has a similar feature 
called motion photo. And once again, it's just like taking a normal photo, but if the motion setting is on, it gets you not quite as much as the iPhone, but it still has a couple seconds of video along with it. On a Samsung, mine happens to be an S21 Ultra. Not all models of Samsung will have this feature, but if I go into camera, I see this little play button icon. The second button from the right is looks like a play button. If you tap it, it says motion photo off. Tap it again, it says motion photo on. So with motion photo on and you just take a picture, you get that couple seconds of motion. Let me show you some examples. And I'm just gonna use Google Photos now to show you these. So here is a bird that is fishing. And if you've ever tried to take a picture and catch them when, they, when their head hits the water, it's impossible. How am I seeing that motion? It's this little play button right here. This is in Google Photos. You can play the motion or you can tap pause and just see the still. And you get the proper frame by scrolling up and then you see all the shots in in this in the motion photo and you can get whatever one you want if i want him just just aiming for the water i can take that and you tap save a copy so instead of making a key frame it saves a whole other photo you still have your original motion photo and you have the still then actually, if that still is all that you really want, you might want to go back and delete the motion photo because they are big files with that two seconds of video. Here's the review. Using Google Photos on Android, you can view the motion from either iPhone Live Photos or Android Motion Photos. Just click the play icon. You can save the video separately by swiping up, tapping export, and then video, or you can pick a different frame, and I showed you that. I do wanna show you export as animated GIF. So same thing with this bird, let's swipe up, and then look at the, all the options, and there is export. Export and GIF and export. Now I'll go look at that. And there is the animated GIF. So I can post this anywhere and that motion will be there and will will repeat. Then just a word about the pixel. On the pixel, the similar feature is called top shot. It captures less time than the Apple or the Samsung, and it's all before the shutter button. It does not capture sound, but it has that same ability to pick the best frame. And my favorite example really is, if you've ever tried to capture lightning, you know how difficult it can be. But with motion photo, no problem. As soon as you see the lightning, you snap the shot, and you get the couple seconds before you snapped it and you can find the frame where there is the lightning. Pretty cool. I'm Chris Gould with Geeks on Tour and this was Fun with Photos. Stop your sure? Uh, thought I did. Nope. All right. Somebody else. There we has go. It. There we go. Well, you <laughs> did. Now, interesting. I had one of my neighbors uh, try to get all of their photos uh, off their iPhone, and they were all live photos. They just didn't know how to do it, and they all the pictures they took were live photos, and they were all great big files. And they didn't know what to do with them. <laughs> so if 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 you get it to your computer, is there a way there to edit as well, or do you have to use Google Photos or or do it on the phone. Yeah, uh, usually when it goes to, there are exceptions. I'm not 
Good question. I'll have to research that. But generally, when you copy a live photo to a computer, it becomes two files, the still and the video. Okay, thanks, Chris. Great, great presentation uh, and good information. Okay, uh, October is Cybersecurity Month. So we're going to talk to our or have our security expert, Bob, talk about Cybersecurity Month. So, Bob, go ahead. October is Cybersecurity Awareness Month. It's an annual reminder to stay safe in the digital jungle. Greetings, cyber explorers. Welcome to October, the spookiest month of the year, and not just because of Halloween. It's Cybersecurity Awareness Month, a time to remind ourselves that the internet, while amazing, can sometimes be like wandering through a digital jungle. There are dangers lurking around every virtual corner, but fear not, with a bit of knowledge and the right tools, we can swing through this jungle like pros. Let's dive into the cyber underbrush and uncover how to stay safe and sound online. The dangers to watch out for before we arm ourselves with cyber machetes and and a malware shields, let's identify the creatures of the cyber underworld. Phishing attacks. These crafty crooks send emails or messages that look legit, but are designed to steal your information. They might masquerade as your bank, a favorite store, or even your grandma, though grandma's spelling is usually better. Phishing can come in the form of emails, text messages, or even phone calls, and often involve urgent or threatening language to trick you into providing personal information. Malware, malicious software that includes viruses, worms, and trojans. It's like inviting a termite colony into your wooden cabin. Yikes! Malware can damage your files, steal your data, or even allow attackers to take control of your device. Common signs of malware include slow performance, frequent crashes, and unexpected pop-ups. Ransomware. Imagine a cyber pirate hijacking your ship and demanding treasure for its return. A-up or walk the digital plank. Ransomware encrypts your files, making them inaccessible until you pay a ransom to the attackers. Even then, there's no guarantee they'll restore your data. Spyware. This sneaky software spies on your activities, gathering intel without your consent. Think of it as a nosy neighbor peeking through your blinds. Spyware can track your keystrokes, capture your passwords, and monitor your online behavior, often leading to identity theft or financial fraud. Adware. It bombards you with ads, slowing down your device. Picture a pop-up book where the pop-ups just never stop. While adware is generally less harmful than other types of malware, it can be incredibly annoying and may also track your browsing habits. EDOS attacks Distributed denial of service attacks Overwhelm servers, making websites unavailable. It's like a virtual flash mob that crashes the party. These attacks flood a website with traffic, rendering it unusable for legitimate users and often causing significant financial and reputational damage. Tools to protect yourself. Now that we know what's out there, let's gear up with the best cyber protection tools. 
at Devirus Software. Norton, Avast, AVG, and Bitdefender are the cyber equivalent of a sturdy shield and sword. They can detect and eliminate various threats. Make your choice, but remember, only choose one. More is not better in this case. And a virus software scans your computer for known malware, removes it, and protects you from future infections. Make sure to keep it updated regularly. If auto-update is available, leave that turned on. Firewalls. Think of these as your digital moat, keeping unwanted intruders out. Windows, Mac OS, and most operating systems have built-in firewalls. Make sure they're enabled. Firewalls monitor incoming and outgoing network traffic, blocking suspicious activity and unauthorized access. VPNs, virtual private networks. Tools like NordVPN, Avast SecureLine VPN, and ExpressVPN create a secure tunnel for your data. Perfect for those who value privacy, like secret agents or anyone using public Wi-Fi. VPNs encrypt your internet connection, making it difficult for hackers to intercept your data and providing anonymity online. Password managers, tools like Bitwarden, Dashlane, and 1Password help you create and store complex passwords because password 123 just doesn't cut it anymore. Password managers generate strong unique passwords for each of your accounts and store them securely, so you only need to remember one master password. Pass keys. Pass keys, a new form of passwordless authentication. They work by creating a unique pair of cryptographic keys, a public key that's stored on the website or app, and a private key that stays on your device. When you want to log in, your device confirms your identity, often using biometric like Face ID or Touch ID. And the two keys work together to grant you access without needing to type in a password. Two-factor authentication adds an extra layer of security by requiring a second form of verification. It's like a second lock on your door. Burglars be gone. 2FA typically involves something you know, a password, and something you have, a phone or security token, making it much harder for attackers to access your accounts. Best practices to follow. Now, let's talk strategy. Here are some best practices to keep you out yes. of the cyber trap. Keep software updated. Always update your software and operating systems. Those updates often patch security vulnerabilities. It's like getting a new and improved lock on your door. Enable automatic updates whenever possible to ensure you're protected against the latest threats. Use strong passwords. Avoid the obvious. Combine letters, numbers, and symbols. If your password is password or 123456, we need to have a serious talk. A strong password should be at least 12 characters long and avoid common words or phrases. Consider using a passphrase, a series of random words strung together. Be wary of links and attachments. Don't click on anything suspicious. If an offer sounds too good to be true, it probably is. Remember, no Nigerian prince is going to send you millions. 
verify the sender's email address and look for telltale signs of phishing, such as poor grammar or unusual requests. Back up your data. Regularly back up your important data. If ransomware strikes, you'll be able to restore your system without paying the cyber pirates. Use both local backups, like an external hard drive, and cloud backups for redundancy. Schedule backups to occur automatically, so you don't forget. Educate yourself and others. Knowledge is power. Stay informed about the latest threats and share this knowledge. If you can teach grandma to use email, you can teach her about phishing too. Follow cybersecurity blogs, attend webinars, and participate in training sessions to stay up to date. All devices, all operating systems. The digital jungle doesn't discriminate. It's out to get all of us, whether we're using Windows, Mac OS, iOS, Android, or even a smart toaster. Here's how to stay safe across all platforms. Windows. Use Windows Defender. Keep Windows Update active and be cautious with downloads. Windows Defender is a robust built-in antivirus solution that provides real-time protection. Regularly scan your system and enable advanced threat protection features. Mac OS. Enable the firewall. Use Gatekeeper to block apps from unknown developers and consider additional antivirus software. Mac OS is known for its security, but it's not immune to threats. Gatekeeper helps prevent malware by allowing only trusted apps to be installed. iOS Android Only download apps from official stores, App Store or Google Play. Check app permissions and update regularly. Mobile devices are prime targets for attackers. Review app permissions to ensure they're not accessing more data than necessary. Use mobile security apps for added protection. Smart devices, IoT. Change default passwords, update firmware, and consider setting up a separate network for smart devices. Many IoT devices come with weak default passwords that are easy to hack. Regularly check for firmware updates to patch vulnerabilities. Isolating smart devices on a separate network can prevent a compromised device from affecting your main network. In conclusion, Cybersecurity Awareness Month is the perfect time to take stock of your digital safety. Think of it as fall cleaning for your cyber life, but with fewer dust bunnies and more malware scans. Stay alert, use the right tools, and follow best practices to ensure your journey through the digital jungle is a safe one. Remember, the internet is a wonderful place when you know how to navigate it. Happy Cybersecurity Awareness Month, and may your digital travels be secure and scam-free. Very good. Uh, cybersecurity should be second nature to us. We hear about it so much, and 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 you and I and, and Ron and, and the rest of of Tech for Seniors uh, try to instill it on people enough that it should become second nature to them so they can enjoy uh, the productivity and the fun things that you can find on the internet and the and using AI and so on and not be worried about it. You shouldn't be so concerned about it that you don't enjoy using it. Just make it second nature. Uh, and, and I do uh, always remember that someone once said to me, 
a lock only keeps the honest people honest. So if somebody wants to get in, they're going to try to find a way to do it. So just be very careful. So speaking I, of fun the things. Idea, the idea is simple. Make somebody else an easier target than yourself. Yeah. So uh, I found something, you know, I do these websites of the week and I try to make them as interesting as I can. I find some things that you can get lost and spend hours negotiating and, and, and moving around and learning things. So let's take a look at one uh, called uh, uh, How Things Are Made. And let me bring it up. And why isn't it there? Okay, well. Tech for Seniors present the website of the week with Huey Poplock. Please like this video and subscribe to our channel. Website of the week number 22 presents MadeHow.com, a treasure trove of information that demystifies the manufacturing processes behind an extensive range of products. From items like you use daily, like refrigerators and vacuum cleaners, to more complex technologies like jet engines and nuclear submarines. This website offers a deep dive into how these products come to life. MadeHow.com provides step-by-step -step explanations complete with illustrations and diagrams detailing every stage of the assembly and manufacturing processes. Each entry includes not just the how-tos, but also the why-nots, background information, inventor insights, raw materials, applications, and future possibilities. Plus, you can expect details on byproducts, quality control, and more. Imagine exploring the making of blue jeans, holograms, or even artificial snow, all explained in an accessible, easy to understand manner. Whether you're curious, a general audience, or someone seeking detailed educational material, MadeHow.com is your go-to resource for learning how products are made. Let's uncover the fascinating world of manufacturing together how products are made. There are several ways to look for the different products. One is by volume. There are seven different volumes, each containing different items. Or you can do it alphabetically, and it will show them across all of the volumes. Or you can do a search. So let's do a search for candy corn. And there's candy corn. We'll click on this and it takes us to the candy corn page. Now there's a great many ads because that's how they pay for this free service. I'm going to take a break right now in the recording and turn off all of the ads. The clutter of the ads is gone. So let's take a look. First, there's a background, a history of candy corn, uh, the raw materials that go into it the manufacturing process, and they do show a graphic of how it's done. Then they talk about several items and explain some things about candy corn, how it's made and so on. And then some uh, quality control and any byproducts or waste, and then how to learn more. So that's it for a particular product. We can also look at the inventor biographies either by alphabetical or we can do a search. Let's do a search for Franklin. Benjamin Franklin, we'll click on that. And we are now on the Benjamin Franklin biography. Shows his lifespan, some information about him and a good article about him. And then you can actually leave some comments too. And that's how you can learn about some of the different inventors. There's also a film reference Let's take a look at that. It gives us many things, but again, we can do a search. Let's do one on 2001 
Space Odyssey because we were talking about that recently in a different meeting. So let's go ahead and take a look at that. Do a search. And as we look here, there's all kinds of information about it from a website called ask.ai. And it gives you information about the movie, some background to it. And also, as we scroll down, it will give you some places where you can look at some related videos. This is a trailer. This is a movie list. And this is the semi-complete movie. And there's some more information for searches. Website of the week, number 22, How Products Are Made. I'm Huey Poplock. Short and sweet, but it's a, a, a place where you can spend a lot of time and get lost. It sure beats playing solitaire. So, uh, and with that, uh, if you would go ahead and uh, say, we'll say thank you to our people that have been watching on YouTube. And uh, we're going to invite them to join us on Zoom if they'd like to. There is room. But uh, if not, uh, we'll see you next week. And right now we will turn it over to Ray. And he's going to talk about some music. Yeah, no, I like that when you showed that clip just now, Huey, of the 2001 A Space Odyssey, one of my favorite movies. And in that movie, the uh, computer was named Hal. Well, Hal got that name from IBM. One letter each in the alphabet earlier. Just thought I'd throw oh, I didn't know that. That's interesting. A little bit of trivia out there. All right. And uh, today we're going to talk about Chris Christopherson, singer, songwriter, and actor. So Copilot has provided the information in these first three paragraphs. Quote, Chris Christopherson's life and music career are surely remarkable and multifaceted. Born June 22, 1936, Brownsville, Texas, Christopherson was a Rhodes Scholar, a Golden Gloves boxer, and a star football player. He also served as a helicopter flying U.S. Army captain before walking away from a West Point faculty position to pursue a career in music. Now, Christopherson's journey in music began in the mid-1960s when he worked as a janitor at Columbia Studios while writing songs during the day. He became one of country music's finest songwriters known for hits like Me and Bobby McGee, Help Me Make It Through the Night, for the good times and Sunday morning coming down. His gravelly voice and rugged good looks also made him a successful actor with notable roles in films such as Pat Garrett and Billy the Kid, A Star is Born, and Lone Star. Throughout his career, Christopherson experienced and endured the tales of love, loss, and regret that he wrote about in his songs. He was a father of eight children and was married to his third wife, Lisa Myers, for the last four decades of his life. Christopherson passed away on September 28, 2024, at his home in Maui, Hawaii, surrounded by family, unquote. In my opinion, not enough credit has been given to the songs Christopherson wrote that were hits for other singers. Consider Ray Price as well as Patti Page, I'd Rather Be Sorry, Joe Simon as well as O.C. Smith, Help Me Make It Through the Night, Bobby Bear, Please Don't Tell Me How the Story Ends, Peggy Little, I've Got to Have You, Jerry Lee Lewis, and many others with me and Bobby McGee. In fact, even Kenny Rogers did a version of this song early in his career with his band, The First Edition. Christopherson helped form and was part of the supergroup, The Highwaymen, from 1985 to 1995, along with Willie Nelson, Waylon Jennings, and Johnny Cash. Now, today's clip is from 1978, has Chris singing with Rita Coolidge, who he was married to at the time, that was from 1973 to 1980, and of course the song, Me and Bobby McGee. Now, while Christoph Christopherson wrote this song, we all know it was made famous by Janis Joplin in 1971, who he dated briefly. Here it is. He was such a great singer. He was a good... He looks 
and a good songwriter, and yeah. I think the Grateful Dead did the best, but Chris thinks that Janis did the best. Yeah. <laughs> he Wonderful. looks so young in that picture, though. Oh, All yeah. right. Yeah. Wonderful. Great. Thanks, Ray. Yeah, Ray, thank you. Uh, we had a little problem with the volume on it, so I just turned up the, uh, my speakers a little bit more, and it was fine, and I just turned them down when we came back. So, But thank you very much, and everyone, thank you for joining us. And now we're going to go to the questions and answer period. Don't run away. Uh, we're still here for another 20 minutes or so. Uh, you're first. You got your hand up. My question is for Chris, and it has to do with uh, the uh, motion pictures. Uh, the question is, um, if if you, uh, is it something you would turn on when you want to do a motion picture and turn off? <clears throat> and the reason I'm mentioning that is, excuse <clears throat> me, is because if you leave it on, the files are a lot bigger. And if you, and if you um, left it on all the time, would it, would it not, the files become really large on your phone? What, yes. what are your suggestions? Get a bigger phone. Get a new <laughs> phone. <laughs> But yes. should, it's something you should turn on or off, depending on what you, you would just leave yes. it on all the time. No. I leave it on all the time because. She has a bit new I, phone. I don't, I don't trust <laughs> myself to remember to turn it on. You know, if you're, you snap a picture of a person and you end up with their eyes closed, if you always have it on, then you can find the frame with their eyes open. If you if you keep it off and just turn it on when you need it, eh. which is one thing with the Pixel, their top shot has an automatic. It doesn't have just an on and off. It has an automatic. So with the Pixel, if it sees that there is motion, it will turn it on. Whereas if you're just taking a picture of a flower, it will it will keep it off. That's That's nice. But yes, it takes up a lot of space. And you probably should turn it off to avoid that. But remember to turn it on when you're taking pictures, basically of people. Yeah, and that was the interesting thing and on my, Yeah, and that was the interesting thing on my Pixel was because I I couldn't find it. There wasn't I couldn't find it. But in fact, it wasn't. It wasn't. It was in the automatic mode, so it wasn't doing. It wasn't doing the motion pictures because I don't usually take pictures of something moving right it's it's as long as if it's a static not moving picture then it's not going to turn on right yeah i and i haven't really tested that so i would be curious if yours is always on auto and you take pictures of people does it turn on so that you could get the photo of them not with their eyes closed i'm going to check that today yeah i'm i mean that's what it should do but I haven't tested it. And, and I like, I like, a, go ahead. 160 miles an hour cat five now, are you? Oh gosh. I, I better put mine on the uh, live motion so I can get some good pictures. And, and, and if the camera, if I disappear while I'm holding the camera, at least I'll have some good pictures. <laughs> <laughs> oh, only if they're uploaded to the cloud, you know, when you're yeah. going. It's going to be, there are going to be a lot of them, oh, a yeah. lot of clouds. All right, yeah. Murray, your hand is up next. You're muted. Yeah, I, a couple of things. First of all, when you commented about glass, something else you might not know about glass, it's it's actually a liquid, a very, very liquid, a viscous liquid. liquid. And uh, I sort of, uh, well, if you look at a very old building with the glass from 100 years ago, you'll notice that it's thinner at the top and thicker at the bottom because it's been slowly flowing down. I discovered this when I was a kid. I was into glass blowing, and this drugstore had uh, racks with glass tubing on it. And the glass tubing, some of it was oval, not round, because it had been sitting there for a long time. Then I have a, a, a technical question about uh, Chromebooks. Um, one of the uh, fellows in our re residence has a Chromebook and he, he can't get it off a dual, dual split screen. There's a horizontal bar across the middle. You can move it up and down, uh, but you can't move it all the way down. You can't move it all the way up and uh, he can restart his computer and it doesn't, you can't get rid of that split screen. I'm wondering if 
anybody has a, an idea of why that is and how I can help him fix it. It's a setting. <clears throat> it's a setting that he's turned on. And I, I don't have my, my Chromebook here. I'll, I'll look that up and send it to you, Murray. <clears throat> but it's a, it's a setting. <clears throat> okay, thank you very much. That's great. And then I have another question. There's a lady who uh, has quite has, uh, difficult memory problems, and she, but she wants to be able to use the computer in our building for email and but that's all she wants to use it for and i'm wondering what rate what email you would recommend to set up for her so that on a what is essentially kind of a public computer i mean it's not accessible to anybody but the residents but um to, to be able to uh, do set, what what would be the simplest for her to learn and use email do you think and any, any opinions Say probably Gmail. She just has to remember to sign in and to sign out. Right. Yeah. Well, of course that would be the case. And of course, if you turn off the computer, it's one of those ones that automatically wipes out all the cookies and all that when you turn it off. Okay. Uh, before we go to Carl, I would like to welcome Lillian from Jacksonville, Florida. I don't believe I've seen her on here before, and we're glad you're here and welcome uh, everyone. Uh, welcome, Lillian. And with that, the next uh, question, Carl, you had your hand up. Yeah. Okay. Best wishes, first of all, with the storm for you and all your neighbors in the area. Uh, I want to mention to Chris, I tried that uh, live uh, video or photos. And what I found on my S24 Samsung is that it shows a, you know, the two seconds or so of each frame. But I could not click on an individual frame. When I went to do that, it went back to, you know, just one frame. No, not that frame, but it went back to the original video. When I click on it, you know, it runs the short video. But I couldn't pick an individual frame for some reason. Okay. First, is, were you using Google Photos? No, I was using uh, just Samsung. Samsung. Okay. And I forget. You know, I, I, I clicked on that little, you know, uh, icon, the second from the right, as you pointed out, and it would take, in fact, I did a, a, a video of you explaining the, the feature. <laughs> 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 and what I, it was just, you know, convenient. And so then I went to try to pick out an individual frame like you did with, you know, your husband. And, right. uh, and, and when I clicked on the individual, they showed the individual frames like you have shown, but I wouldn't let me touch an individual frame. Whatever I touched, it went back and ran the whole thing. Okay. On the Samsung gallery, you have to, number one, tap the button that says show um, motion. Right. And number two, well, there is you no... Sure. <laughs> Um, it's a, it's a different button. You have to basically take stop on the frame that you want and then take a screenshot. So here it is just showing, showing the whole thing. Yeah. Three seconds. But if you then go back, so I want the one, then you tap this little button here that is basically taking, is capturing that shot and making a oh, separate okay. picture of it. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll try that. Okay, very good. And I want to comment to Ray on uh, Chris Christopherson, you know, served in a, you know, some of their prior life. I remember, you know, watching, uh, you know, I was, of course, Ray watched a lot of movies from the 40s and 50s, and it always amazed me that people that you saw, like Kirk Douglas and... Uh, you know, uh, Henry Fonda and other that they served in the military. And when you saw them, and I don't mean as entertainers, you know, but actually served and were drafted. And it, it was always, you know, it was their other life. You didn't, you didn't, you never realized they had another life before being movie stars. Yeah. When, when I uh, put the, together the notes and I saw the word Rhodes Scholar and Golden Gloves Boxer in the same sentence, uh, yeah. it was pretty <laughs> impressive. Yeah, very, very good. Thank you. Bob, you have your hand up. Unmute yourself. Can you show me how to turn this on on a pixel?
Chris? <coughs> you you talking to me? Yes. No. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Maybe. Okay. So here's a Pixel phone. And where's the camera? There's the camera. Um, we're, seeing, we're just seeing you and your block. There we go. There we go. Okay. So here's the camera on a Pixel phone. Okay. And you can either tap the uh, settings button in the lower left. Uh huh. And there's there's top shot right there. Okay. Or Thank you can you. even just what was it? Swipe up. Yeah. Swipe yeah. up gets you to the photo settings, and you have, as I say, there's off, there's auto, there's on. Okay. And, and Chris, you. I I checked and uh, I went back and looked at some images of people, and the top shot was automatic, and they were. Lots of then when I swiped up, you could see the all the pictures to choose from. So you you could see that. And but it but but some pictures I took this morning of the sunrise, it's on auto and it's 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 not there, right? Because there's no motion, right? So yeah. so it is that's not, cool. not not within three seconds, not anyway. discernible. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So I think that's a really good feature. That's why I like my that picture. is. Yeah. That is. <laughs> I, I do wish the Samsung and the iPhone had the auto feature. Right. So, Bob, just remember that when you go and take Pickles a picture. Look better. Now, yeah. If you go out and take a picture of a horse, if you go out and take a picture of a of a cactus, it's not going to be there, right? You gotta, you've gotta, you've gotta, you know, take a picture of Alice moving or walking or something, and then you'll see it. <clears throat> and Chris, you mentioned that for lightning, I had never thought about that, and I've tried to capture lightning yeah. before, and I'd never thought to do the. Uh, What's it called in the uh, sort of the Samsung? But well, I, I have, have some motion. Good, you'll probably have yeah. some good chances to do it. Yeah, that's what, that's, <laughs> what I, that's what I'm thinking too. So yeah, <laughs> and other. Uh, I mean, Carl mentioned in the chat uh, photos of people shooting baskets or you know anything in sports. sports. You when you see something that looks good, you snap the picture, and it captured a couple seconds before your snap so you're going to get the shot it's great wish my mind worked that way yeah really <laughs> <laughs> murray your hand is up again go ahead yeah, i just want to mention in victoria you sure don't get very very many chances to see lightning maybe once every 10 years we get a, a lightning lightning storm well you can move to florida <laughs> yeah, we're we're the we're the lightning capital of the world. You're yeah, the I don't think I want to move there pictures. today. I don't no, move there probably today. not today. <laughs> but I used to get, spend lots of. I used to go there for every year when I lived in the east. I used to go there for ten days or two weeks every year. Usually oh, either Christmas or or Thanksgiving. <laughs> this is the one time of the year that I think I'd like to be somewhere else. Yeah. But uh, it, it's not often I want to be. I hope you can. Yeah. Carl, your hand is up. There we go. Uh, speaking of lightning, uh, here in Michigan, we get lightning and uh, and it really hits objects. <laughs> you know, it really destroys things. And I have a ham tower and it's been hit a few times. But I was out in Arizona one time and I saw all, I met a ham out there and I was looking at his tower. It wasn't grounded. I said, how can you have this 60-foot tower and it's not grounded? All the lightning in Arizona is cloud to cloud. It doesn't go to the ground. I was a little shocked. If you were shocked, you got hit by lightning. Well, that was figure of speech. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> That's not necessarily true, uh, Carl. Uh, most of the forest fires that we have to contend with here in Arizona are started by lightning. Well that, well, that makes sense. Almost all of them in the whole Northwest and Canada, too. Yeah. So we, they hit the ground for sure. Okay. Is there any uh, any other comments or questions? Thank you all for being here. Don't forget Tech for Senior Live on Thursday. I hope I can make it and I'll be there. Uh, if not, Ron will do, will do it without me. And, and hopefully uh, I'll also have power by Sunday. Uh, to be able to do the wind sig. So with that, on behalf of the entire crew at Tech for Senior, thanks everybody. Stay safe. Bye, Bye. Huey. Thanks, guys. Mm -hmm.